Hello everybody and welcome. Today I am very excited because I have teamed up with four other Arkham content creators to create five deck guides total between the five of us for the investigators from Hemlock Vale, the Feast of Hemlock Vale, rather. I was lucky enough to be gifted Hank Sampson. So I'm going to be talking all about Hank. I have my first deck that I built for Hank here today, uh, and we're going to dive into that deck, a few cards, uh, notable interactions and cards from that deck, and then uh, I'm going to shout out all the other content creators that are teaming up with me uh, to do this for all of you. You can find all relevant links in the descriptions for this video, as well as the deck guides if you wanted to follow along with the cards in detail at your own pace. We're going to start by talking about Hank Sampson. So... Hank's stat line is 3153. So Hank's stat line with the five fist and one book obviously pushes our boy towards fighting. While he can use the survivor card pool to flex, that is not what we are going to be focusing on with this deck guide for this video. Hank's ability makes him a natural tank. Tanking means having a good ability to take damage and horror for yourself and your teammates. So Tank's ability is, uh, sorry, Hank's ability, but he is Tank Samson for this one, is you may be assigned damage and horror dealt to ally assets and other investigators of your location. And then, when as a reaction, when you would be defeated by damage and or horror, instead heal all of your damage and horror and swab this card with its bonded resolute version either side face up. Hank notably has 5-5 five, five for a Sonk. We'll get into the Resolute versions in a second. If this is by chance your first time seeing Hank Sampson, don't worry, we're going to get to that. But Hank's low health and sanity pools may look daunting. 5-5 five and five is not a lot. But do not worry, because you're a Dark Souls bo boss and you have a second phase for the Mythos. Notably as well, your Elder Sign effect is only plus 1, which is actually nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's a plus 1 token, which is going to help you pass, but it has no ability on top of it. After being defeated in, defeated in Hank's normal mode, you become one of the resolute versions of our favorite farmhand. This changes your stats, adds an additional ability to Hank, and changes his Elder Sign for the better. However, be aware that when you change into either version of Hank's second form, you lose the ability of being healed. This means that any damage or horror placed on Hank cannot be removed by healing, and with only four potential damage or horror in a secondary form, this can be a danger in Hank's hunt for his paw. So, we have the assistant version up here in the top left, which changes its stat lines to 3344. Four. You cannot be healed, but you can still be assigned damage or horror dealt to other ally assets uh, to or damage to ally assets or other investigators at your location. So is there that still that Hank thing going on? As a reaction, when one or more horror is placed on you, you draw a card. Pretty sick, pretty sick. And your Elder Sign effect is now move one horror from Hank Samson to an asset you control. His warden version. It changes the stat lines to 4163, uh, and it's now, uh, when one more damage is placed on you, you gain two resources, and the Elder Sign effect is move a damage from Hanks to an asset you control. Notably as well, the in the Assistant version, you have four damage. In the Warden version, you have four horror before you die. So the numbers, like, are pretty low, and you cannot be healed, but worry not, for we are Tank Samson, and that is what we will do. Before we get to the deck itself, I do have his signatures to talk about. Stout-hearted, two-cost event, play when you engage a non-elite enemy, move up to two damage and or horror from Hank Samson to that enemy as damage. It's a powerful signature. It's uh, moving damage and horror notably doesn't count as healing, so this card is active in his resolu resolute versions as well, which is kind of sick. When horror healing and damage, like, not healing, but like being able to heal... Damage and horror in the Resolute version is a very powerful effect. His signature weakness, on the other hand, wears paw, or par, as we like to say around here. Discard cards to the top of the encounter deck until an enemy is discarded. Attach wears par to that enemy, spawn it at a connecting location if able. Attached enemy gains elusive. So elusive is a new keyword in Hemlock Vale. I haven't internalized it completely, so bear with me if I'm a little bit wrong on this, but I believe it is... When the enemy is dealt damage or the enemy makes an attack, it disengages and moves to a connecting location. So you kind of have to hunt it down if you can't kill it immediately, which is just something to be aware of. However, one thing to also be aware of with Hank's um, signature weakness here is that it deals horror at the end of the round, and the horror is direct. Which means that if you draw this in the upkeep phase, you will be taking one direct horror. Just something to be aware of, and something that you should always be considering in the back of your mind when you are playing Hank Samson. You also, if you draw it during your turn and you can kill the enemy, 
that's also really sick. <laughs> so, like, I think that, in theory, drawing during your turn is going to be really good. And it's also kind of nice because there's really no risk, potentially, to... I mean, if you draw a hunter enemy, there would be bad. But, like, drawing this as your last action, if it hits an enemy that doesn't have hunter, it's pretty minor. Because you were still going to take that one direct horror anyway during the upkeep phase. Or at the end of the round, if you drew this during the upkeep phase. But notably as well, um, most enemies now have hunter, so... Icarumba. Alright, here is the level 0 version of the deck. You can find a link to this in the video's description. I have uh, all the cards, the accounts, and also the expansions that they come from for ease of reference. The level 0 deck for Hank is relatively straightforward. Uh, we're running 8 weapons because of Hank's deck size. So uh, Hank has a bigger deck size. His deck size is actually 35. And he can run Spirit and Innate cards level 0 to 2, as well as also play Survivor 0 to 5. Um... Because of his bigger deck size, normally I usually run around six weapons in my level zero decks. Um, but because of his bigger deck size, you're looking at eight weapons to hit like a similar density in the deck. So that's why I chose these eight weapons here. And they kind of uh, don't have synergy, but that's kind of the idea of the deck. So we're going to dive into further detail, but Hank's weapon choice in a scenario should be very flexible. Hank should be battling with whatever he can get his hands on and changing his weapon as necessary in the moment. That's kind of like the big hook for this deck. For me, when I was building it, when I look at Hank Sampson, he has five fists. <laughs> which is, like, if we go back and look at this guy, this dude has five fists, which is a lot of fists, right? So, I was like, Hank is like a survivor who can really take advantage of the survivor weapons that are generally kind of clunky because his fist is so high. He's kind of like, in theory, potentially a Tony Morgan um, of survivor class, right? Like not in the damage output, but in the ability to take the weapons that are normally designed for three or four fist and to turn them into like more reliable because of that. So while the um, weapons aren't like super reliable, they're gonna get the job done and you're gonna be switching through them a lot as, as it goes. Um, I'm not going to talk in too much detail about this deck. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's like I say on, on the slide here. We have weapons, we have soak, we have cards that give us economy, like card draw and resources, and we have skills to help us be better or deal more damage as we go. So it's kind of like all pretty straightforward. But let's talk about upgrades and notable cards as we go through this. So, Hank's Five Fist means that he will have combat relatively handled with his weapons for a few scenarios. Instead, our initial focus in this deck will be to increase Hank's survivability. We'll be doing that in the most traditionally survivor way we can, with two copies of Jessica Hyde and a Charisma Permanent. This will allow you to have both Jessica and the soon-to-be-upgraded Pete Sylvester in play, greatly adding to Hank's survivability. So, Jessica and Pete, we're going to talk about them more as we get further into this video as well. But they are a great traditional combo to ensure that a, a survivor can just survive. And honestly, most of my first builds for an investigator like this, uh, for example, like Daniela, Daniela Reyes, or even Kelvin, Kelvin Wright, uh, they are this kind of dream team Jessica Hyde, Peter Sylvester combo, uh, which is also going to be increasing his stats. It's going to increase everything about his book across when you get the three of them, and it's also going to keep him alive. So as you can see, Jessica Hyde, two of them in, uh, and the Let Me Handle This are out. The two copies of Let Me Handle This are going to be out for it. Uh, Charisma, three experience for the core set. Sorry, from the core set. Uh, you're going to have this. You don't even have this for some reason. You could just proxy it by just saying, I have charisma. But this first five experience is going to be important to get our survivability up and running. Um, please note that while I'm giving you an upgrade path, I highly suggest that you look at the deck and make your own choices. This is kind of just like my own uh, approach to deck building. I don't like to follow an upgrade path. Um, and I respect that, you know, upgrade paths are great at providing tools for you to go through and just upgrade without thinking. But sometimes um, you need to kind of, um, I, I think it's, it's better to like adapt to it. And I imagine that a lot of deck builders who give upgrade guides also kind of suggest this as well. So, um, but it's, you should like figure out um, what you're missing or what you feel like your deck needs more of. And don't, like, you can stray from the upgrade path or choose your own order for the upgrade path for it. Like, for example, if you like the Let Me Handle This, you can keep them in and replace something else. Like, you could go to a one of the Sparrow Mask or do something else. 
um, cut like a quick thinking if you don't like it, right? It's it's kind of like you can do what you want with it. But I cut the Lemmy Handle this because it kind of is just uh, another version of Hank's ability. Hank's ability allows you to take damage for people, which is kind of what Let Me Handle This does in, in a way, in a roundabout way. Not exactly, but it's very similar. So, our first 5 XP that we earned is in our deck, and now we're going to be going ahead to look at the next 10 XP that we want to be spending. This next, uh, to, to bounce off what I said previously, this next session of purchase, uh, of purchase is going to be a little bit more freeform. This means that the order of the upgrades will depend entirely on how your deck is performing, um, but depending on if you want to increase your weapon because you need to like kill more or if you're feeling like your weapons are fine but you want to survive better you can change the order of this next 10 experience for what seems most right for you and what you need um before we get into it though i want to talk about a bit more in detail about the weapons so we're running each of the above weapons as two of in our starting deck these weapons have all the aspects of survivor weapons meaning that they're good but they aren't as consistent as other weapons. While Fire Axe will be a weapon we will replace quickly, not because it's bad, but because we aren't building around it, the other weapons will, be the, will either be upgraded or remain in the deck in this guide's plan. This means that when you're looking at solving enemies, you'll need to be looking at how you best want to solve the puzzle of fighting enemies, because Hank's starting kit is less obvious than I swing my machete. Of course, when you upgrade, it can become pretty... Uh, I swing the fire extinguisher, I rev the chainsaw, I hit with the time worm brand. Notably, I am not following that for my upgrade path. I want to kind of keep this scrappy survivor combat Hank that I envisioned when I was building this deck. But again, you can make your own cho uh, changes on this. This is just what I would do. So, um... The next batch of 10, uh, 10 XP doesn't have to be spent in a set order, but upgrading these weapons before your others will improve your combat prowess. So the Hatchet, a new card here from Hemlock Vale, is going to replace the Fire Axes, which is nice because it's kind of two axes. One axe turns into another axe. I know that there is another... There's an, actually an upgraded Fire Axe in Hemlock Vale, but we're not building or planning to build around Dark Horse, so that's why I went with the Hatchet instead of the upgraded Fire Axe. Um, so it switches the fire axe to always deal plus one damage because you don't need to have your resource pool empty, but it does require a bit of a dance to it because if you defeat an enemy with the hatchet, it goes into the enemy and you don't get that hatchet back until you defeat someone. But luckily again, Hank has five fist, which means that maybe you have another weapon to help kill something, or you can just use something else to get the last point of damage. Or, alternatively, you can just change the order in how you structure your combat with your enemies to, uh, if it's a three health enemy, swing with the hatchet first, and then just punch the enemy normally for your last action. If you have Jessica hide and play, you're going to have six fist, so it's really easy to get there, and then you get your hatchet back. I actually think that the hatchet is actually going to be a lot easier to dance around than it reads on the tin, um, especially if you have other weapons in your kit. The 18 Derringer is, is an example of this. Uh, the upgrade 18 Derringer is just more of a good thing. It's cheaper, has an extra shot, and also has a buff ability if you miss. So that's just going to be replacing the level 0 18 D D uh, Derringer because we're upgrading from there. Nice and easy so far. The last 4 XP in our, ne our 10 XP batch will be going to upgrading both of the level 0 Peter Sylvester's into their level 2 counterpart. Uh, when I say the last X4, uh, 4 XP, I don't mean that it has to be the end. Again, I just want to stress that. If you feel like you want to go with Tapete before you go to the Hatchet, for example, go for it. Um, this upgrade works well with Jessica Hyde upping Hank's survivability immensely. While a Resolute Hank can't heal, both Jessica and Peter in play can soak for him and, as needed, provide healing for him. There's a reason they are the Survivor Ally Dream Team, and they work really well with Hank, because while you can't heal, if you take non-direct damage, you can put it on Peter or Jessica, and then use that to heal, and you'll be sitting pretty. Peter Sylvester is an easy upgrade, is going to replace the level zeros. Let's take another quick stop here and talk about Peter and Jessica for a moment. When you are assigned damage or horror, if it is not direct, you may assign it to eligible assets you control. Because of Hank's ability, this means that you can assign the damage dealt to other investigators to Peter and Jessica. This is why Tank Hampson can tank so well, because with him, everyone has a Peter and Jessica in play. So looking at it again, you may be assigned damage and horror dealt to ally assets or other investigators at your location. And when you are assigned damage, you get to deal how that damage is put out unless it's direct or there is another rule changing for how things go. Um, so that means that Peter and Jessica can also soak for other people if you're at their location with Hank, which is really nice. All right. 
We have 15 XP in our deck now, which means that at this point, our deck should be quite competent and up and running. We can survive an entire scenario. We can solve enemies as they show up, but now it's providing more consistency to our kit and other survivability. Again, this next batch of 14 XP can be purchased in the order that you want. If you feel your economy is lacking, choose to add the economy cards. If you're lacking damage, add the extra damage cards. Uh, I've had worse too. Uh, can be an easy upgrade to our stand together. Replacing the general the general reliability of stand together for the added survivability that I've had worse provides. So two I've had worse, which cancels damage and gives you resources, uh, which gives you economy and also some like damage prevention, which is nice to do the stand togethers. You could key cut like one stand together and one um, sparrow mask if you really feel like you want to do it, or again something else. But this is just what I was going for. Just when I upgrade. I like to look for something that hits the same level, right? So like, I've had worse is going to give you two resources. Stand together gives two resources. And at this point now, you should assume that your teammates have their economy up and running. So stand together is going to be less um, viable um, for like other people as well. And you can use this I've had worse to be more viable for you. Baseball bat two makes baseball bat zero more consistent, providing either damage or the bat back in hand. But luckily... This deck can utilize the upgraded Baseball Bat if it hits the discard pile, which is super sick. Uh, brute Force is an additional tool that Hank can use to deal with enemies as they show up, adding another piece to the song and dance to that is his combat arsenal. Um, brute Force, the two Brute Forces are going to replace the overpowers in this deck building uh, suggestion here. Because uh, I actually view them like, while not similar, are kind of similar. There could be something else that you want to take out, but I did the overpowers because, again... I was looking at what is like a similar piece that I can take out without ruining other parts of the deck. And while Brute Force isn't going to replace itself like Overpower does, it does deal more damage, which is really nice for dealing with enemies. Hunting Jacket. Uh, this new card from Hemlock, Hemlock Vale replaces the leather coat in the last phase of our upgrade plan. It provides some additional horror soak and gives resources. And you're going to want to use this card quickly because you'll want to be soaking on this immediately. So the Hunting Jack, you can put cards from your hand, turn those into resources up to three cards. And then you also, when it's defeated, you get those cards back in your hand. So you're basically getting paid for the cards in your hand, but you're still going to draw them later. So don't sit on this as like your long-term soak. This is soak that you want to turn into resources. You want to pay itself back. And then you want this jacket to be destroyed so you get the cards back in your hand. Because you're actually not losing anything with the Hunting jacket which is really nice this is a pretty easy upgrade replacement we're getting rid of the leather coat zero um because you know it's the body slot <laughs> it's the body slot right uh there we have it the 29 xp deck for our good friend hank simpson uh hank samson this deck is a relatively straightforward survivor soak deck using pieces that we've seen previously in kelvin and york while adding on with a bigger pool of survivor weapons for hank to use before I chat about card suggestions after the 29 XP, let's talk a bit about Hank and some hooks of this deck, because there are some neat interactions that we can touch on here. The first one, uh, we're going to also talk about Hank as well on top of this. So the first question that we should be asking ourselves with this deck is when should I go resolute? This is an important question in Hank's gameplay loop that I believe is the key to unlocking the investigator. Right now, at this moment, my theory for Hank is that you want to let the shift to resolute happen naturally. You don't want to force it. I saw when we were just like in earlier discussions, people were like, ooh, I want to die and get to my other version right away. And maybe that's the right thing to do. But I think you want to let it happen. And then when you are defeated and turn resolute, you want to choose the option that is best for the situation and go from there. Speed running to defeat of your first form will likely lead to a quicker defeat in your second form. Look at it this way. Losing on purpose seems like a really good way to keep on losing. Of course... This is all just my current theory for Hank, and he may surprise me, but my recommendation for playing this deck in, in this video, in this deck guide, is don't try to turn to your new form. Look at it as a reward for making it to the end game of scenario. Kind of like how with Kelvin, you don't want to try to die, you just want to let the scenario kill you until you're nearly dead, and then you win. I think it holds a similar truth for Hank Sampson. No in the thick of it? What the heck? Yes. I decided against In the Thick of It for this deck. Um, in the Thick of It, if you don't know, is a powerful Arkham card that finds itself in like pretty much every deck I build, except for now two investigators, really. Uh, I believe that there's a bigger risk for Hank than the other investigators when it comes to that initial trauma. I believe that like Kelvin, the other investigator, Kelvin Wright, that I don't put In the Thick of It in, any trauma that Hank may gain through the campaign will be tough against his game plan and limit your time in your first phase. 
This may be wrong in practice, after seeing some campaigns with Hank, but working with my theory that you don't want to rush to the second phase, I stuck to the idea of no additional trauma when building the level 0 version of this deck. Uh, because a lot of people, they end up retiring Kelvin that I've seen and I've experienced, and it's because you're trauma fishing, and I don't think you need to rush Hank Sampson. Just win the game, play the game, and you're going to do great, and you don't need to rush to get there. Again, I can be wrong with all this, but this is what my current theory for Hank Sampson is. What is Quick Thinking doing there? Great question, Past Justin. Let's talk about it. So Quick Thinking is a strong skill card that I often run in Silas, Mar Silas Marsh. And because Hank has Silas's deck building with the innate skills, uh, well, innate cards, but they're mostly skills, I wanted to showcase that with, that with this skill card. A neat option that Quick Thinking provides is to help mitigate some of the clunkiness that the Pitchfork and the Hatchet Combat Loot can give to Hank Sampson. For example, while attacking a 3 health enemy with the Pitchfork, you can commit a quick thinking to the attack. This is now going to put you, without Jessica Hyde, attacking at 7. With Jessica Hyde, you're attacking at 8. You're going to succeed by 2, and then you can use that extra action from the quick thinking to pull the Pitchfork free. Likewise, the extra action can help soften the occasional odd combat you'll need to have to make the hatchet work. However, if you disregard all of this, the nice thing about uh, quick thinking is that it's also just an extra action, more time to kill things. And you also might be wondering, Justin, are you running Pitchfork until the end of the campaign in this deck? In this deck plan, yes, I actually do think that Pitchfork is a viable enough weapon for Hank Sampson to be run in Scenario 8. It's not your only weapon, but again, in, like, especially with the caveat of in this deck, with this style, where it's all about um, being scrappy and adapting your combat to what you get, I do think that Pitchfork has a home up to Scenario 8 in this specific deck. If it was my only weapon, probably not, but it's not my only weapon. I have a kit of weapons to just, you know, fight with. Um, Push to the Limit is a new card in the Feast of Hemlock Vale that provides an important piece to this deck's combat kit. As I've mentioned earlier, this deck's approach to combat is very scrappy, utilizing weapons that are not as reliable, meaning that you shouldn't get married to any specific weapon and plan ahead to be uh, swapping the weapons as they come. Push the Limit provides some consistency within this kit, working favorably with a discarded hatchet or a team derringer. Additionally, it also works well with Pitchfork, because Pitchfork is a weapon that attacks for 3 damage, and that's a lot of damage. So, you have discarded your hatchet. Your hatchet has left play, or something like that. Your Pitchfork has left play. You've committed it, you've played, uh, you, you started with a Pitchfork, you stab someone with a Pitchfork, you pick it up, you later grab your 18 Derringer. You should put your 18 Derringer into play, get rid of the Pitchfork, use Push to the Limit, use the weapons again recursion is a very powerful thing that survivor has and this is like a combat focused recursion that you're able to take advantage of what do i do during downtime every goon will eventually face a turn where there are no enemies to kill and they often find themselves asking what should i do now the answer to that is quite simple you should be thinking ahead to the next mythos phase are you going to see an enemy? Maybe use Take Heart to refill your hand and resource pool to get that next weapon ready. Are you or someone else on your team worried about a treachery? Spend some time digging for or playing some soak in your deck. Or alternatively, make sure you're at their location. Uh, downtime for a goon is sometimes complained about, but you could always just be building to the next step. I understand that downtime for a goon when you basically just have a Cyclopean hammer is very noticeable, right? Because you just, all you have been doing is swinging the hammer. So like you don't need anything else. But this kit actually rewards you for being very versatile with your weapon choice, which means that you should always be looking and asking, how can I improve my combat or when do I want to do this, this switch? So don't be afraid to gain resources or draw cards because your goal is simple. Kill enemies and keep your teammates healthy. And that's what you should be focusing on from step one to step 10 of a scenario. And there's only 10 steps in a scenario. There's only 10. When do I press my emergency button? So I've included two emergency buttons in this deck, two copies of Perseverance and one copy of Wrong Place, Right Time. Perseverance is actually pretty easy to know when you need to press that button. If you would die, don't. Would I stop myself from changing to my resolute version? No. If I, I would never perseverance on the, to, on the, the swap. The perseverance is only for step two. So just, that's my personal thought for this. But the wrong place, right time is a little bit harder to know when to use. 
and the question on if you should be using this card as card draw. Wrong Place, Right Time is a very interesting card from the new set, and I think that Hank is probably one of the investigators who can take advantage of it above average than what the card reads. But I don't think you need to run two. I like it as a one of. I know it does have good symbols, but symbols... <laughs> symbols aren't everything. I'm not going to put a card in my deck for just symbols. If it's uh, if I want symbols, I'll grab a skill card. So, um, I think if you can like use it to kill a Cherished Keepsake and turn that into a card, I think that's good. If you could even like kill your Leather Jacket and turn it into four cards, for example, I think that's fine. However, I wouldn't be using Wrong Place, Right Time to kill a Jessica Hyde or a Pete Sylvester because uh, I want those in play. This, of course, changes if you have a Jessica Hyde or a Peter Sylvester in your reserve, but just something to be like aware of when you're doing this. Um, what I would do is I would look at this card as providing a third phase for Hank. So when you're in your Resolute version, you can just be like, I'm ready to keep on fighting. I just drank my Estus Flask and now I'm ready to rock. Going beyond 12, uh, 29 XP uh, is here's some suggestions. Uh, Chainsaw, Fire Extinguisher, they're just more weapons. I think there's a really fun Chainsaw deck you can build with Hank, but that's not the deck that I wanted to build. But Chainsaw would still do well in this deck. Same with Fire Extinguisher, even if it is a little bit boring. Uh, however, you actually can use the um, push the limit on the fire extinguishers bot and ability, and I don't think it exiles because you avoid. Um... No, I could be wrong on that. I could be wrong, but it also just it allows you to because uh, you ignore all costs. You can just play it to um, to just evade all enemies engage with you, which I think is a nice nice powerful ability on that one. Uh, upgraded lucky is really good, and nothing left to lose is also some really powerful economy. How can you not love it? All right. That's it, everybody. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this deck guide for my first Hank Sampson deck. You'll likely see me playing something slightly similar for our first Blind Hemlock Veil play. Uh, it might be a Wilson Richards deck. I don't know. But please like and subscribe. However, that is not all. I've, as I said at the start of the video, I've joined up with four other content creators for this video. You can check out the video description for links to their deck list covering the four other investigators from the Thieves of Hemlock Vale. So this is Dare BK, uh, who you might know from the Ancient Evils blog. Uh, elsewhere from the Strength in Numbers blog, D Scarpack or Quick Learner on YouTube, and well as Valentin, uh, um, Valentin uh, who um, does all of the uh, deck guides on Arkham, like the 30k series. Um, we did a, a, a thing together uh, for Rita, Hyperphysical Shockcaster, a few months back, and also a uh, uh, Valentin is the one um, who organized this whole thing. So a uh, huge thanks to them for getting me involved. And uh, last person I want to just say thanks to are all of the patrons. Hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching, everybody. This is a new format for my deck guides. Let me know what you think in the comments, and let me know what you think of Hank Sampson. Have a good one, and as always, a GG's.